Hi Colts, this is Mrs. Aladdin. I hope that you had a great day. Today is Friday um, and I've got on my Colt Pride t-shirt. I don't know if you can see that. There you go. And I hope that you do too. Um, if you have a Colt Spirit shirt on, have your mom or dad um, or whoever's at home with you send me, um, good grief, my hair's all over, send me a picture of um, you and your Colt shirt and we'll try to include it in the yearbook that we put together at the end of the year. So um, consider that. Uh, I'm here to do some more reading from The One and Only Bob by Catherine Apple and we are starting a chapter called forgiveness so here we go forgiveness seems like forgiving humans is one of those doggy things we're all supposed to do like having zoomies or doing bed boogies I've written it's written into our canine souls well somehow I didn't get the memo the one that apparently went out to every other dog on the planet about forgiveness why should I forgive the human who tossed me and my siblings out into the night? When you forgive, you lose your anger. And when you lose your anger, you get weak. And when you're weak, you can get hurt all over again. The art of human watching. By the time we reach the park, the sky is definitely in a bad mood. Gray clouds galloping like panicked horses. The nervous scent of rain on the way. The kind that makes you antsy in your own skin. When we get near the employee entrance, I hop into Julia's backpack like always. We enter through the special gate where George shows his ID, checks in, and says hi to the staff. Pet dogs aren't allowed at the park. Foxes, wolves, jackals, my dog cousins, they are. But in my opinion, even though they're technically part of my extended family, they're nothing like dogs. Only dogs have perfected the art of human watching. The smartest thing we ever did was figure out how important the human gaze is. So often, when we follow our owner's eyes, we're rewarded with something amazing, a smelly sack, a glazed donut, a glazed donut that's fallen on a smelly sack. We follow every blink, every sidelong glance. We see it wherever it is before humans do. We understand before they do. And if there's a glazed donut involved, we eat it before they do. Puppy eyes. It's mid-morning, still pretty early. There aren't many visitors around yet. We've got a meeting in 20, George tells a couple of workers, Hank and Sonia, who groan. Just a quick one, going over contingency plans one last time in case there's any flooding. During the last hurricane, a small part of the park flooded, mostly near the reptile bill. George helped move cages. He came home smelling like cotton mounds and copperheads. It was all I could do not to barf. Weather service just issued a tornado watch, Hank says. I thought we were having a hurricane, Julia says. We are, Gus, but sometimes tornadoes are spawned during hurricanes, George explained. Julia frowns, but a watch means maybe, not for sure, right? Yeah, but I want you to head home, George says, just in case. Please, Dad, just 10 minutes, Julia says. She's using the special voice she reserves for moments when she really, really wants something from her parents. I guess kids manipulate moms and dads the same way dogs manipulate humans. I don't know, George begins. I promise, Bob. I figure that's my cue to pop my head out and look adorable. So I do. Hey, Bob, says Hank. Sonia reaches over and scratches my ears. I'm pretty popular around the park. I give George my best puppy eyes, and he caves. Ten minutes tops, he says. Meet me back here. Puppy eyes works every time. Mr. Oog. Here's how I figure puppy eyes got their start. Cave humans were sitting around a fire wearing mammoth fur and grunting about how there was nothing on TV because TV hadn't been invented yet. And some wily wolf thought, whoa, they've got leftover mammoth meat. And he probably whimpered and cowered and did a tummy display and looked pathetic enough that Mr. Oog finally tossed him a bone. And soon enough, a few zillion years later, Viola, man's best friend. After all that time, here, there's a thing, like a magnetic attraction between dogs and humans. We've studied them for so long we can read every twitch and sigh. Suppose it was easier than chasing down mammoths, and I get it, I do. The behind the ear scratch, the food in a fancy bowl, the bed by the fireplace. Gotta admit that Julia's pretty fun to hang out with, and I'm grateful, really I am, that her family took me in. Still, I don't need them. You need someone, eventually they let you down, and you end up feeling like a real doofus. It seems to me, I'm just pausing for a second, it seems to me like really um, Bob is having a hard time trying to figure out like how humans and him fit together. You know, like he's been hurt really bad and doesn't feel very trusting of other humans, um, but he kind of wants to trust Julia and, their, and her family, but it's hard because he was so 
poorly treated by other humans in the past. So that's a hard thing. Okay, back to the book, The Park. As Julia walks, I sneak peeks out of her backpack like I always do. We pass the meerkat family poking out from their den holes like a whack-a-mole game like they used to have at Max Mall. I see the flashy flamingos with their one-legged balancing act and the terrifyingly beautiful tigers. Even their cute cubs give me the willies. Families, I've noticed, take a lot of different shapes. Jim and Joe, the penguins, adopted an abandoned egg, and they are the sweetest doting parents you ever saw. I see it with humans at the park, too. Families of all shapes and sizes and colors and genders, and yeah, they all seem to do just fine. We round a corner past Sea Otter Alley. Oliver and Olivia are floating calmly on their backs, holding each other's paws. It's pretty adorable, I have to admit. But me, I don't need all the trouble that comes with family. Babies puking, toddlers whining, spouses nagging. Talk about a design flaw. And here's a picture of Julia and Bob going through the park. Oh, I wonder what that is. Is that the otter? I can't tell. Yeah, I think that's supposed to be an otter right there. It looks like a nice place. You see all the clouds that are coming that are looming? This um, hurricane is definitely coming. They're talking a lot about it, aren't they? change. The park's pretty big. Lots of twisty paths and fascinating smells. All the parts have names. There's the African aviary, the outback, the penguin cove, the lemur land. It's like puzzle pieces of the world. A little Africa here, a little Asia there. Dogs, you can find us pretty much everywhere. Our territory is earth. As long as we're hooked up with humans, that is. Along the shady paths, volunteer guides will answer your questions. They'll tell you about how animals used to roam one part of the world or another until things changed. Things change. That's one thing I figured out. Don't ever assume a little patch of the planet belongs to you. Things change. Boxes go flying. My inner wolf. On our way, we always stop by the wolf habitat. Julia loves wolves, probably because they remind her of me. You have to look hard, maybe even squint a little. But if you try, you can catch a hint of my inner wolf. It's in the eyes mostly, also in my distinguished profile. I dream I'm a wolf sometimes, and when I wake up, I'm panting and my fur's on alert, and I'm feeling, yeah, the world could hurt me, but I could hurt the world right back even harder. Life, like there's a dangerous, hard part of me chained inside, struggling to go free and just, I don't know, get even. Then I go see what's for breakfast. Kimu. There's a gray wolf at the park who makes me look, who makes me a little jittery. Jittery as in sometimes I worry he might like to eat me. His name is Kimu and we struck up a conversation when a mutual acquaintance of ours, a mockingbird called Mitch, introduced us one day. Like Nutwit, Mitch likes to taunt me because I'm domesticated. Gives me lots of grief about how free he is soaring stringless above the whole town. I'm not the only one who's pampered, I say one day. I mean, look at Kimu, he's not exactly running wild. As soon as the words were out of my mouth, I regretted them. And when I looked at Kimu's I could kill you with one quick bite expression, I really regretted them. In my case, I said, moving the subject along, I've lived wild. It ain't a picnic for a dog. What was it like? Kimu asked. He moved closer to the edge of his domain. He had a strange odor, intense and scary and a little bit intoxicating. Well, I was just a pup, I said, abandoned by the side of the highway. Kimu was listening intently must have been tough. All I could think about was food, and water. I didn't like the catch of my voice. An owl got me. Those guys are fierce, Kimu said. Can't hear them coming. I know, right? I relaxed a little. I hate owls, said Mitch. Hate them with a passion. They eat birds, you know. So do wolves, said Kimu, giving Mitch a meaningful look. So you were wild once, I asked Kimu? Never. Born and raised in captivity. Suzu, uh, Suzu over there, she was. She told us stories that would curl your fur. Honestly, it's nice to have a roof over my head. It's tough out there, man, really tough. I suppose, said Kimu. Here's a picture. I think that that's Bob. Looking a little anxious and scared of Kimu, the wolf. Let's see what Kimu has to say. I looked at him and for the first time I wondered if he, if I really did have any wolf in me. He was a majestic animal with teeth that could shred a tree trunk. I'm also majestic, but more portable, with teeth that could mingle a pencil with enough time and effort. 
Hey, Bob, Mitch said, do dogs howl the way wolves do? Of course we do. So let's hear something. A duet, maybe? He fluttered his wings, revealing a startling patch of white. Do you know Talk to the Animals? They play that one on the carousel. Go away, Mitch, said Kimu, with just the right amount of menace in his voice. Come on, just a little howling. Pretend there's a moon. Pretend you're free. Pretend Kimu growled, and I did too. His was pretty impressive, guttural, deep. It spoke of death and dismemberment and all kinds of unpleasant bird nightmares. I growled too. It spoke of being mildly peeved. Still, Mitch got the message. He disappeared, a blur of wings. Actually, I've never howled at the moon, I admitted. Me neither, said Kimu. I feel kind of silly doing it here. All right, I think we're going to pause there, and we'll see what happens when they... Oh, the next, the next section, it starts with, we're almost to my favorite spot in the park. What is your prediction about where his favorite spot would be? Do you have any ideas on where he might really love to go hang out? I wonder if he really loves to go see his friends, Ivan and Ruby. They're on the cover of this book. You see him? This is Ivan and this is Ruby. All right, we'll have to find out later. I don't know if I'm going to read this weekend, but I'll be back on Monday with more stories, okay? I'll see you guys later, and in the meantime, have a great day and a good weekend. Bye, friends.